Take your Bible, turn to 2 Peter. Uh, appreciate everybody coming out tonight. This is December, isn't it? And uh, I don't know about you, but this day has drug out on, drug out or drug on. It seems like it's gone slow for me today. Or maybe I'm just in slow motion or something like that. Old, old age, oldage. It must be, Roy. Second Peter chapter 1. Um, I printed off some prayer requests that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Some things that came in today. Um, there's a lady that goes to my mom's church down in DeSoto. Um, she is a sweet lady. I love her to death. Um, but she <clears throat> has um, cancer, and she started chemo this week. And um, if it doesn't work, uh, I don't know what they're going to do for her. Uh, so it's that serious with her. And like I say, she's a, I love her to death. She's a sweet lady, loves the Lord. And um, her name is Donna, so I want to pray for her. And um, there is uh, uh, a lady that we know from Arkansas. Um, her son and Caleb are always good buddies at camp. And they would play some of these video games together online. Well, she has cancer. And um, from what we hear, uh, it's in her bones. And she's a young lady. Um, and that's, you know, that's troubling. And so, um, I hate cancer, officially. I hate cancer. And so, uh, my heart goes out to anybody that has to endure that. And uh, so, we'll pray for them tonight. And remember to keep praying for Lisa. Uh, she is uh, begrudgingly at home tonight. And um, she just, she's had two major surgeries in a month and she is just wiped and uh, she wants to be up and doing this is I mean her job is decorating the church and um, she's not here to do it so I know it's getting to her so you pray for her that she can get on her feet as soon as possible and because uh, I miss her when she's not here I'd miss her being here so I'm not the same not the same you know so pray for her tonight. Uh, Second Peter, uh, what we're doing, we're studying uh, basic doctrines, fundamental things. We've covered so far, and I'd, I'd like to maybe put these on like an MP3 disc for people to listen to, um, uh, or for maybe, you know, distribute in Kenya or something like that to some of the pastors. We've covered God the Father, We've covered his son, Jesus Christ, and, and studied him, studied the Holy Ghost, and tried to cover as many points as I thought uh, as we could. And uh, so now we're going to go to what I think is probably the next most important thing. Uh, actually, I should have started with this one, because if we don't get this one right, none of the others will be right. And that's the issue of the Bible. Because if the Bible, if we don't, if we don't get this issue of the Bible settled, uh, I had a lady call me and ask me if I knew of a church that she, she had somebody she knew that lived up around 270 in Manchester. Want to know if I knew of a church up in that area that she could, that I would recommend. And I'm going, ma'am, that you're talking St. Louis Metro. There ain't a church worth a nickel up in that whole area up there. I said, we got people from that area and farther to come down to our church because there ain't one up there. And, uh, and it's generally because of the Bible. And she's, it's, this lady told me that um, she used to belong to a church years ago, was part of an, uh, like a prayer team that prayed for people. And the pastor appointed a woman that she found out was a witch praying over people in the service. And she said, there's no discernment. I said, it's because there's no Bible. Without the Bible, without the rule book to guide us. 
Who in here has ever played Monopoly? Raise your hand. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question. Those of you who play Monopoly, that free parking area on Monopoly, what's that for? Huh? To park? What was that? Hold on, hold on, hold on. This was the answer I was waiting. I was waiting for some brave soul to pipe in. Isn't that where you get the pile of money? Who plays it like that? You'll never play it again. If, if you've never read the rule book to Monopoly, I will destroy you playing Monopoly. I will tear you up. Because I actually did one time read the rule book, and that's, and I know how that's played, where all that money, like if you, know, if you get one of those cards and you have to pay $15, that goes in the middle, and whoever lands on free parking gets it, that's a made-up rule. It is a made-up rule. It is not in the rule book. You see what I'm getting at? If you don't have a rule book, how do you know to how to play? Now, I've been a child and I've watched children, I've watched my grandchildren play and I know that when children play games they make the rules up as they go along depending on who the bully of the group is, whoever the boss of the game is or whoever can yell the loudest. That's whose rules they follow. When somebody does something that somebody else doesn't like then they'll say that's not, that is not fair. Show me the rules. That's, that, that's a rule. You can't do that. Show it to me. Show it to me. So my point is this, and I've made this point before. Every one of you has a job somewhere, and I guarantee you at that job you work, there's a, there's a whole group of manuals on how that comes. George, George's company digs lime out of a cave big deal right how many how many manuals do you think runs that company scores, scores of them huh thick, thick manuals these binders that are this thick and beyond right OSHA standards health and safety standards lime standards kiln standards how to build this machine, how to take this machine apart, how to do this, what happens if so-and-so said this on the job, stuff like that, right? So whoever's managing that company, if you can't just go and own yourself a McDonald's restaurant. You have to, you have to be qualified. You have to have money in the bank. You can't, if you want to own a McDonald's restaurant to get rich, you better be rich first before you own one because that's how it's done. And then they send you to Hamburger University. There is actually a Hamburger University that they train men and women who want to own a McDonald's restaurant and they have to be certified because there is a whole list. Ray Kroc wasn't the guy who invented the McDonald's hamburger. The McDonald's brothers were. Okay? And the McDonald's brothers worked out a system where they were throwing out hamburgers very quickly, which changed the whole restaurant business because back in the day when you ordered a hamburger the waitress carried your order in then they cooked it to order and then 15 minutes later you got a hamburger at McDonald Brothers restaurant you ordered a hamburger they handed it to you while you were handing your money in Ray Kroc was selling and I'm getting to my point here Ray Kroc was selling um, uh, milkshake machines and the McDonald's brothers ordered a ton of milkshake machine and it, and it threw him. He said, surely this has got to be a mistake. When he checked into it, he found out it wasn't because they were opening restaurants up. Croc, and there's, you know, arguments about whether he did them dirty or not, but he bought the McDonald's brothers out and then franchised and he, div he took their system and perfected it and made his fortune running McDonald's franchises. But they operate according to very strict guidelines. And Lindsay and I got into an argument the other night about whether or not McDonald's is in Kenya. I say no, 
because when I first went to Kenya, I'm looking for a McDonald's restaurant. And I find out that there isn't one, and it's because McDonald's, if you go to Taiwan and go to McDonald's, the french fries taste exactly the same as this one over here. Do you know why? Because they have standards. They only buy their potatoes from a certain location and grow them in a certain place under certain conditions. And they got into it with the Kenya government because Kenya grows, they eat a lot of potatoes in Kenya. And some politician probably wanted his company selling the potatoes to McDonald's. And McDonald's wouldn't do it. So McDonald's pulled out and they said, fine, we won't put any restaurants in Kenya. If we, if we cannot choose how we bring our food and how we deliver it, then we won't, there are no McDonald's in Kenya. I don't think there is. So anyway, my point is this, even McDonald's, and it's a stupid french fry, but they're good. Okay, they're good. They're better than everybody else's french fry as far as I'm concerned. But if you eat a french fry here or go to Taiwan and eat a french fry at McDonald's, it's the same french fry. There is a standard for french fries in this world. That's a piece of information that you probably could live without. But what I'm saying is this, why is there not a standard for Christianity? If there is a standard for a french fry in this world, why is there not, according to most in Christianity, and I'd say most, who claim to be Christian, why is there not a standard for Christian belief and salvation? There is. Most people just don't recognize it. And you're holding it in your hand. You're holding the manual. Now, George, you said you're, at your work there are scores of thick manuals. You ever seen the IRS code, Jan? How, how tall is the IRS tax code? From the floor up? Higher than... It could fill a room. IRS tax code. Okay? And that's just one country and their tax code. See how simple this is compared to that? And it actually is even, it boils down to, there are key verses in this verse that we use to lead someone to salvation. It actually is simpler than this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And see, even the new Bibles get that verse wrong. They mess, I'm not bending down to pick that stuff up. Don't ask me. I did, walking through this sanctuary in a rush a while ago, slammed my right shoulder into that pillar over there, and the pillar didn't move and get out of my way. And my shoulder hurts. Probably going to have to have an operation again. Anyway, 2 Peter chapter 1. Here's, here's the scripture for us tonight. And let's start in, in verse 15, because Peter's, he's setting down the standard here he's establishing what really is the simplicity of what we all should agree upon as to what the bible is and where we're supposed to get our understanding about who god is who jesus is who the holy spirit is and so on so verse 15 peter said moreover i will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance Now, I'm going to stop right here, dwell on this verse for a couple minutes, because this verse here really sticks. I don't know why. I've never seen this verse as important as as it is. But Peter was an apostle. And according to what I see in the scripture, there was a limited number of those. There is not a continuing line of ongoing apostles. Amen? There was only, there was the original 12. Let's kick Judas out, put Matthias in his place. And then we'll bring Paul in. And that's it. John was the longest living of them all. So he writes the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible. Peter knows that he's leaving this world. Paul's last, does anybody know what Paul's last letter was? That he wrote in this world that we know of. You may want to take a guess. 2 Timothy, because he tells Timothy, I'm about ready to depart, okay? 
And so he's giving these last set of instructions to Timothy as he is about to go have his head cut off. Okay? But Peter now realizes his own demise is coming up. He's going to leave this world. His apostleship, no one is going to step in his place. So this is God giving the words to Peter to tell us that God gave the words to Peter and Paul and John and Isaiah. So, and this is what he says. After my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Now, here's the key to this verse. Remembrance. Who in here has a really good memory? I bet you don't. I bet you don't. I bet that if I told you a sentence today in 10 years, you wouldn't remember it. And it probably would mean nothing. 15 years, you'd get, it, you'd get at least one word wrong. You see what I'm saying? You know, we play this game, I'm going to tell a secret, and if I started here at Cali and I told her this one sentence and she was to pass it around the room, by the time it got back to me, it would be nowhere near what I said. That game's played over and over. We all know, lawyers know, video surveillance is a lot better than eyewitness testimony. Right, Cubby? Body cams on cops tell the truth when the person in the car wants to lie about what the cop did. Am I right? Okay. The camera, it, because it is a record of exactly what happened, exactly what was said, and exactly what was seen on that day. It is a record of what happened, and records are, memories are easy to vanish. Records aren't, which is why everything important in life. I got in my car for the very first time a dash camera. And I love it because it comes on and starts recording as soon as I hit the start button on the car and it stops recording when I turn the car off and it's got a little 8 gig chip in it and it'll loop and if I ever need that, if I ever get into an accident and need, because the last accident I was in, the person behind me who hit me lied through her teeth. She lied through her teeth. She said on the police report that the light turned green and that's why, and she was expecting me to go, but the light was still red when she slammed in the back of my car at 40 miles an hour. She lied through her teeth to the police. So I got a dash cam in my car recording everywhere I go because that will not lie people will am I right Amen. especially when it comes to who God is and religion and how you get from this world to the next people are lying all the time even people that we thought were supposed to be the good guys some of them are starting to tell lies now and it's bothering me so this is why Paul, Peter said, after my deceit, these things always, how can you have them always in remembrance if they're not written down? And this is his point here. So verse 16, for we have not followed cunningly devised what? Fables are stories that are told that my grandmother told me and my sister stories she probably had her grandmother tell her stories that go all the way back thousands of years. Now, how accurate do you think those stories are handed down from generation to generation? Not very. Not very. The Native Americans all tell, you know, all these countries around the world in their history, they tell stories of giants and dragons, but those aren't reliable. They tell stories about a flood, but they're not reliable. They tell stories about the sun standing still, but they're not reliable because they're oral tradition. And over the years, people's remembrance, every time we tell a deer story, George, what do we do to that deer? What do we do to that poor deer? Add 20 pounds, two points, and four more hooves and fangs, right? And we, we, we got him. We didn't shoot him with a gun. We got him with a knife. Okay, that's what we do. That's what men do to stories. So we did not follow cunningly devised fables. That's very important. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the most important event 
in world history, the first and second coming of God to this earth, the most important event that has happened and will happen, and we better not get this wrong. Because there's a counterfeit. There is a counterfeit. But we were eyewitnesses of his, majest, uh, of his majesty. He's talking about Jesus. For he received... And now he's going to tell the story that we read in Matthew 13, the transfiguration of Christ. We were eyewitnesses, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. I mean, listen to Peter. He's, he, he's enraptured here with remembering what he saw. He saw Moses and Elijah on the mountain that day. And he heard the voice of God. Can you imagine that? Remembering, here's Peter, an old man, and he's remembering the story, and he's tears in his eyes. Oh, the majesty of the, the voice of God. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mountain. The problem is, I wasn't there. And I didn't hear it. But I believe it. I believe 2,000 years later, I believe it. Amen. Okay? So it's verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. This is the point that he's making here. So we set back up now. I want you, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. That God, I heard God's voice say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But he said, after my decease, who's going to be around to tell what I heard? What I'm writing down. Isn't it a genius thing that God invented? Paper and ink. Because even before cameras and computers, people could draw pictures and write words down. So that they could be remembered for thousands of of years not just five minutes ten minutes an hour a year after it happened but remembered for eternity so the sure the more sure word of prophecy peter himself is placing the written word as being more sure than him standing in front of you preaching Oh, I'd love to hear Peter preach, wouldn't you? I'd love to hear Paul preach. We wouldn't understand it because he spoke Greek. Okay? But I'd love to hear him preach. But I have something better than hearing Paul preach. I have what Paul wrote down. Or what Paul said to somebody who wrote it down. That's what we know happened with Paul. Um, so we have a more sure word of prophecy. Where into you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. The dark place is your mind and your heart. That's the dark place. Because when you came to the Bible, you came knowing nothing. You came know, thinking that you knew everything. Remember those days when we were young and we knew everything? Then we got old and realized we were stupid back then? Amen? Okay? So now we know because the light has shined into the dark place of our mind and our heart. But that even this Bible is temporary. Because when the day dawns, until the day dawn and the day star rise in our hearts. Because in Jeremiah 31, God said, I was going to write my law in their inward parts. So in heaven, we will not be reading our Bibles. We will not be carrying our Bibles. We will know it. We will know every word of it. I've heard of some people who had memorized vast portions of Scripture. I've never heard of anybody memorizing the entire Bible. I don't know that it's even possible. Okay? But it can all be written down, and it can all be copied accurately. And it was. Okay? So... Now, as, it, as, it, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Now, verse 20. Knowing this first. Now he's going to tell you why the written word is more valuable 
than Peter's spoken word because Peter's going to die knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture the word prophecy here does not re, is not restricted to meaning foretelling the future okay it means proclamation proclaiming son of man this is in Ezekiel son of man prophesy prophesy and say unto them that's God's way of telling you what prophesying means say it say it son of man say it no prophecy of the scripture and I have that underlined scripture script means written down and if it ain't written down I wouldn't buy that car if it wasn't written down I wouldn't buy that house If it ain't written down I wouldn't buy that whatever it is you're gonna buy if it isn't written down if the guy's gonna tell you something if he's willing to write it down and sign his name to it then maybe maybe we, we, we can start with that but now that day there's too many liars out there amen too many liars whether they're politicians salesmen or preachers there's way too many liars out there so the scripture no prophecy of the scriptures of any private and he uses the word interpretation here that has a dual meaning number one the word if you look at the word interpret or interpretation in the Bible you'll see it applies to language and it was interpreted this was interpreted saying when, when Jesus said Eloi Eloi lama sabachthani which is interpreted saying my God my God why has thou forsaken me so it has that meaning but it also has the meaning of what does this passage mean and how can it be applied so no prophecy of the scripture number one is of any private translation number one number two is of any private understanding where somebody says oh I got I got new revelations from God I'm getting them every day here follow me you have people like that all over the internet they were on TBN in years gone by okay and the floodgates of false doctrine have opened up on this world and I'm telling you if you just want to fall off the deep end join Facebook and watch YouTube videos all day long because that's what happens to people they quit reading the Bible or they start letting Facebook and YouTube social media tell them what it really says or what it really should say or it says that but it doesn't mean that it means something else and this is why people are just going off the deep end like crazy this is why this row is empty and that row is empty and these rows are empty this is why people don't come to a church where they're just going to give you scripture because they don't that's not what they want to hear for the prophecy verse 21 prophecy came not now he's going to describe how it happened prophecy came not in old time by the will of man so it was these are not Peter's words and I've even oh and I know somebody that's doing this right now let me, let me ask you a question when it comes to what Jesus said in the Gospels and what Paul said in his letters which one is more important to you thank you they're all equal it is it's all inspired all came from the Holy Ghost did it not you knew exactly where I was going didn't you yeah see the Hebrew roots people will do this they'll say well I would rather listen to Jesus than Paul excuse me that is a devil they're the same all scripture is given by inspiration of God all scripture whether it's what Jesus said or what Paul said it is the same thing it is as e one is as equal as the other it comes from the same source God the Holy Spirit divinely imparting these exact words to us for us in our day and in our time and excuse me I did not learn Greek 2,000 years ago and I did not learn Hebrew ever so I'm gonna read my English one and I think it's right amen okay so, but that's what people do they will pit Moses up against Paul or whatever and, and I had a lady write to me she said I've, I've come to Revelation 
I think Paul was a false apostle. And she wrote me this email. I'm going, man, you need to call your cable company and tell them disconnect your internet. Because I think you've been listening to somebody telling you the wrong thing. And I gave her scripture out of Peter where Peter said, read Paul. And she went, oh, maybe I was wrong. I said, you were wrong. But that's what people are doing. They're putting Moses against Paul or Jesus against Paul or whatever. Some are even saying the Old Testament was first, so it's more important than the New. I know somebody's saying that right now. Somebody you would know. And it's tearing me up. Okay? It, it's the Scripture. Period. All Scripture. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God. Who were some of these holy men? Moses. We know, um, um, we know Isaiah. We know Peter, Paul, James, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Some guy named Acts. We don't know who that is. That was Luke. Esther did not write Esther. Ruth did not write Ruth. Okay? No female writers in the Bible. Sorry, but that's, that's the way God, holy men of God spake. So they removed. Why men? Because it was Eve who was caught in deception. Okay? And I, listen, if that makes you mad, I'm sorry, but that's just how God had it. All right? The holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let me give you an example of that. Turn to uh, Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Verse 4, then the word of the Lord came unto me. See it? The word of the Lord. This is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, coming to Jeremiah, and it's saying something. And how do we know? Because it was written down. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. So, let me stop right here and make a point. So why does somebody who say they go to church believe you can kill a preborn baby? Because they don't accept the rules. They don't believe the Bible is the rule book, is the final authority. They believe their mind is the final authority. Okay? I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Jeremiah is being honest. I'm a child, or with Isaiah, my, I am a man of unclean lips. All, Moses, I'm, I'm a man of improper speech. I can't talk. All of, you have all of these men in the Bible who said to God, God, I'm not up for this. this You've got the wrong guy. God says, trust me, i got the right guy. God said, but the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. Whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. That is the method of transmission right there. And a lot of the scholars have been believing for years and still believe to this day, I'm reasonably sure, that they have this idea that the Bible contains the thoughts of God, but not the very words of God. Even what in the, in the academic realm would be a conservative, a man down at um, Baylor University, I think, or Dallas Theological Cemetery, I think is what it is, Dallas Theological Seminary, he's considered the conservative on campus, but he said we shouldn't think that we have the actual very words of Jesus contained for us in our red letter edition Bibles. And he's the conservative of the scholarly world. I don't need the scholarly world anymore. If that's the conservative viewpoint, I don't need it and I don't recommend it. People call me asking, what Bible college should I go to? Don't go to Jesus Bible college. Study your Bible. Okay? But anyway, um, I know we need teachers. But anyway, that's the conservative end of it, is that we shouldn't think that we have every word that Jesus spoke. It's not realistic to say that. But, and yet, Peter said, 
holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Jeremiah is telling us that God put his very words in Jeremiah's mouth. The story of Jeremiah, when Jeremiah had his scribe, Barak, he said, write these words down. Now deliver them to, to the king. When they delivered to the king, the king read three or four pages. What did he do to it? Cut it with his knife, threw it in the fire. Word got back to Jeremiah. The king threw the book in the fire. Jeremiah's thinking, he should not have done that. Because God said, Jeremiah, tell Barak, your scribe, to get back here. Because not only am I going to give you those exact same words again. See, you know what that is? That is God preserving his word. Amen. God is showing you how he does it in the Bible. If one copy gets destroyed, don't worry. I'll give my guy another copy of it. Same words. And he told him it was going to be the same words. And now that I'm good and ticked off, I'm going to add a lot more to it. And he did. He should have never threw that in the fire, Wayne. Okay. But he didn't like it. So he said, cut it up, throw it in the fire, which is no different now than what Bible colleges and seminaries all over the world do, and preachers do, to the same book. So we have that. Turn to Ezekiel. Chapter, end of chapter 2. Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. The end of chapter 2 of Ezekiel God's calling Ezekiel. God came, God came down in the chariot himself. God rode the chariot down from the north, from heaven, and said this right to Ezekiel. Verse 9, When I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. A book. A roll of a book with words in it was written down. And it was in his hand. And he, Verse 10, He spread it before me, and it was written within and without. Meaning what? When you fill up the front of the paper and the back of the paper, what does that mean? There's no more room to add anything to it. Right? So I get these letters. It's cute. I get these letters all the time because when people run out, they start going up the side of the, the page like that. And I got to turn the paper around and read it. So anyway, but that's what happened. And it was written on both sides like the, like the Ten Commandments was. Written in stone, written on both sides. Why? So you can't take away words and you can't add to it. So he spread it before me, it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Now look at verse 1, chapter 3. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll. Go speak unto the house of Israel. Eating it is what you do when you read it. Your flesh doesn't consume it. Your soul does. You're reading the word of God and your soul is taking those words in. And so here we have, so I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat the roll. And he said unto me, son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it and it was in my mouth as, as honey for sweetness, like the manna was that they ate in the wilderness. So here we have another picture of the method of transmission. And here again, when you put your thoughts on paper, you write words down. So it wasn't just the thoughts of God that's given to us in the Bible, up for anybody's interpretation. It's the very words that God picked himself. These words that are in the book of Ezekiel, None of them are Ezekiel's words. Not one of them. Not one of the first five books of the Bible. Not one of those words were Moses' words. They were all God's words put in Moses' heart. Mos the, in fact, turn to Exodus 20. We have another method of transmission. In Exodus 20, verse 1, seven words, God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So that starts the giving of the Ten Commandments. God spoke them, but did he stop there with just speaking? In fact, when God spoke them, 
Israel started backing away from Mount Sinai, telling Moses, tell God to stop speaking to us or we'll die. So number one, the hearing the voice of God is not something you want. I did something on Pastor Mike Online yesterday where you've got all these crazy people saying you need to, this, this one guy claims that he spent years doing various things trying to hear God's voice. Israel heard God's voice and couldn't handle it. So they backed away and they said, Moses, you be the mediator. You go hear from God. You tell us what he said. We'll, we'll believe you. But tell him, don't do that again. And you've got these people saying, we're not hearing from God. And he said, I spent a year reading my Bible and I didn't hear God's voice. What does that tell you? His mind was already made up that God's voice was not in his Bible. Probably the one he was using, he was probably right. Okay? But God wasn't content with just speaking those ten commandments. Moses now come up to the mountain. Moses went up to the mountain. God carved out the tablets, took his finger, wrote out each one of those commandments, put them in Moses' hand. Moses, bring those, take those back down to those people down there and say, these are the Ten Commandments. This is the covenant that I'm making with you. If you'll keep every one of these, then I'll let you go into the land. They were written by the finger of God. The writing was the handwriting of God. The stones were the work of God. That was God himself sending his word himself. That's a picture of Christ is what it is. Because who does John call Jesus? His favorite term for Jesus is the word. John's the only writer of the New Testament that actually called Jesus the Word. Calls him the Word in John chapter 1, calls him the Word in 1 John chapter 5. That's his, and he calls him the Word of God in Revelation 19. That's John there telling you, okay? So that's a picture of God sending Jesus himself down, the Word of God himself. And when Jesus came down, did he argue with anything that Moses ever said? Isaiah, did he say Jeremiah was wrong? You, when you read Jeremiah, Jeremiah wasn't, you, you shouldn't have read Jeremiah, you should listen to me. He didn't say that. He said, I come to do what Jeremiah said I was going to do. In fact, turn to Hebrews 10. You don't mind Bibles, do you? And I was worried about this message tonight. I was going, oh Lord, I don't know how I'm going to preach this. Hebrews 10, this is, there's any one thing that God did for me past saving me it was giving me the ability to minister the word I can't think of anything I'd rather do so in Hebrews 10 he said, verse 5, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Jesus, and so it's, Steve, you're right, it's ridiculous. It's from Satan to say, I'd rather listen to Jesus than Paul. Jesus didn't do anything different than what Jeremiah said or what Paul said. They were not opposing teams. They were all on the same side, giving us every word of God. And I believe that we have translated correctly for us every single word of God. Um, in this series that I, I made some notes today, I'm going to deal, and if you can think of any questions that you have concerning the Bible, I'd, I'd love to help you out with it because I'm here to help. God's helped me when, you know, you, you heard my testimony. I was sitting in my office thinking some things and God said, Mike, this Bible's right. And I believed it, but God didn't stop there. He gave me the evidence to support so that I just, just don't go around saying you need to read a King James Bible. Why? I don't know why. Well, I do know why. So if you have questions, you want to ask me the questions. But I just thought about some things I'll deal with. Why do we have just two testaments? Why are there 66 books? 
Why don't we use the Apocrypha? Why don't we? Because the first 1611 King James Bible that was printed had the Apocrypha right there in the middle. But why and why was that? Why did they put that in there in 1611? Why don't we use it now? The superiority of God's word written down instead of relying on oral tradition. And I've covered that tonight. Superiority of written laws to govern all men, including kings. Kings! Think of the old days when kings ruled. What was the law? Whatever the king said. Right, but if it was a wicked king, like, I mean, who was in charge of Hitler's Germany? Hitler. Everything else was just a sham. Okay, if it, if it wasn't Hitler, it didn't happen. That's why he had to be destroyed. Or we'd be all speaking German, yeah. right? So the word of God even has superior authority to even a king. Okay, so I'm going to deal with that. Method of transmission from God to man. I touched on that tonight. The inspiration of the originals. Preservation of every word in the original tongues. Preservation of every word in a translation. The perfection of the Bible beyond question. These are things I just sat and thought, what, what do I believe about the Bible what can I prove scripturally? Um, what does people need to know? What do the pastors in Kenya need to hear? Because they're hearing, they've got false prophets all over Africa saying, you've got to listen to me, and if you question me, I'm the prophet, I'm God's anointed, and if you go against God's anointed, you're going to die and go to hell. They've got guys like that in Africa and in America telling people like that all the time. You've got pastors running scared over in Kenya, afraid they're going to hell because they don't listen to Dr. O'War. And I'm telling them, no, you don't need that clown. He's an adulterer. You'd read your Bible. Read your Bible. You're free that way, amen? Maybe Dr. O'War will listen to me. Eh, I don't think so. So if you have any questions... Uh, write it down, get it to me, and I'll, I'll try to cover the issue on the Bible, all right?